This is the second event in the Authors Cut series. And the Authors Cut series is a webinar where we unpack several chapters of the O'Reilly book, Observability Engineering. You can think of this series as one part book club and one part cutting room floor and like one part demo, right? So we're gonna talk a little bit about the content, especially since we have a number of folks that haven't read the content in today's chapters, we'll sort of unpack what they're about. Um, we'll also give you a couple of takes that we couldn't fit into the book. And then we're also going to show you how these concepts come together uh, using real world examples. So today's session is titled, How Observability Differs from Traditional Monarch. So we're gonna be covering book chapters one, two, three, and nine. So the topics are, what is observability? Um, how debugging practices differ between observability and monitoring? Uh, lessons from scaling without observability. And then lastly, how observability and monitoring come together. So those are the chapters that we'll be covering. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and start by recapping a little of what we talked about last time, since we have a number of folks that weren't able to join us. Uh, but first, let's go ahead and meet all of today's presenters. Uh, if I can figure out how to make the slides go. There we go. Um, so I'm George Miranda. I'm one of the co-authors of our book and today's webinar host. You can find me on Twitter at gmiranda23. Charity, why don't you go next? Charity Majors, uh, CTO co-founder at Honeycomb. And um, I've been working on this book for three years. I'm so glad <laughs> it's out of our hands. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, Nipsey Tipsy on Twitter. And I am Michael Sickles. I am a solutions architect over here at Honeycomb. Everyone calls me Sickles though. So if everyone says my last name, that's just how it is. We have too many Michaels here at Honeycomb already. That's true. But not as many Jessicas as we have. Um, you, you guys will notice that Liz isn't here today. And that's not because we were fighting. A couple people were like, were you Liz fighting? No, we just, we both like battle for airtime sometimes. <laughs> uh, Liz is traveling. She's in Australia. She'll be back for the next one. Absolutely. And so, uh, yeah, I, 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 think, I think we got it, even though Liz isn't joining us. Uh, but uh, we can start by talking a little bit about uh, how we started the webinar series last time. And I think what I want to frame is uh, today we're actually starting with chapter one, right? What is observability? Last time we started with chapter five, uh, structured events are the building blocks of observability. And really what we talked about in the webinar is, you know, what a structured event is, how that relates to logs, right, how uh, a distributed trace is really a series of interconnected logs, how metrics can all be derived from, uh, you know, uh, summing up uh, various events, and really uh, talking about the need for a very granular data type. So uh, Sickles and Charity, you were both on with me for, for that uh, event. Anything else that you want to highlight about what we covered last time around? think so as long as people just understand the fundamental the value of having an arbitrarily wide structured data blobs and the fact that you can derive any data type you know metrics logs whatever you can derive those data types from the wide events um, and you can't go in the other direction like you can't get the wide event from a bunch of metrics or, or logs um, and the wider the event the more context you have and the more ability you have to like spot outliers or correlate things, be, you know, things between your events, TLER. Yeah, and I think the only, the only thing that I would add to that, right, is that um, a, a structured event, right, like a, an individual unit of work that occurs in your system, right, we are trying to get down to the individual user level, right, where like, I, think, I think what's absolutely key for observability is being able to not run into any dead ends in your investigation. Right. Yeah. So when you are asking questions, when you are trying to see where performance issues are happening, we need a unit of, of work that we can deal with that is granular enough to get down to the bottom of what's happening. Right. And so in this instance, what we're talking about is at the individual request level, right? And and specifically, right, every action, every unit of work that happens within a request, right? We want to be able to capture that. And the unit for doing that is a structured event. Right. We yeah. can compose those into traces and metrics, like Jerry said, right? But the idea is just get super, super granular so that you don't run into any dead ends when you're asking questions. One event per request per service, right? You can kind of think about it like, you know, oh, we had to blow up the monolith where we used to be able to just, you know, attach a debugger at the beginning of the 
of the request and trace all the way through. Well, we blew up the monolith now, and so the request is hopping all over the place. So this is kind of a way of bundling up that context and like passing it along as it hops throughout the system so that you can still reason about the requests from start to finish. And I think uh, maybe a, a little um, uh, counterintuitively, what we did is we started the webinar series a little bit later in the book to lay a technical foundation, right? Because the, the chapters that we're talking about today, mostly chapters one through three, especially, are a lot of pros, right? Just a lot of sort of pontificating about what is observability and why is it different from monitoring? And I think there's a lot of really good information in those chapters, but it's not really grounded in a lot of technical, right? And I think as you go further in the book, it continues to get more and more detailed and technical about what you need in order to pull off the kind of uh, you know, uh, analysis and understanding of that data that you collect. But we wanted to start with a little bit of a grounding in like what fundamentally do we need, right? And we just need a really granular unit of data on which everything else is built. Right? It sounds so, it sounds it sounds like a small thing, but like the entire concept of like how is observability different from you know these other tools and these other ways of debugging systems? It's really it's grounded in the way that you're gathering the data and and the possibilities that unlocks for you, right? The the reason that you know jumping ahead just a little the reason that it's not observability if it's based on metrics is that you don't have that context. You can't do that correlation. You can't you know you can't you know you can't connect what's happening at point A with, with, with what's happening at point B. And so like, I think that's where we start with the structured events is because, um, you know, it, it really underpins the entire philosophy. There's a lot of other sort of prerequisites that you have to have in order to have observability, but they all kind of flow forth from that, that building block. Yeah, and I so I think we wanted to ground the conversation in that, right? And so, uh, I think that's probably a good time to go ahead and switch over to uh, talking about what is observability, right? And so um, what I like about chapter one is uh, a couple of things. I mean, Charity, I, I know you have some thoughts on, you know, getting into debates about the, the definition of observability, but um, I didn't, I didn't want to start there, right? I think, um, uh, Oftentimes, uh, especially in, in conversations with other, other engineers or like notoriously on Twitter, um, we'll go ahead and argue about the definitions of made up words, right? To quote Andrew Clay Schaefer, uh, you know, when talking about things like DevOps or when talking about things like observability, right? And like, we sort of just start mincing words about, you know, what a particular like, you know, incantation of this practice looks like. Um, but what we really do in chapter one is there is a bullet list in this chapter that I think functionally goes through what does observability look like, right? Like, can you answer these kinds of questions in these kinds of ways? Um, but before we dive into that, I don't know, Sickles, Charity, anything else you want to say about what is observability and some of the definitions or, or things we should keep in mind? Well, um, you know, I think that there's a list of like questions and stuff that, you know, as George is saying, and then and then there are other characteristics of the system that you need in order to answer those questions, mm -hmm. which, which are different things, you know? And, and so like, I'll get super religious about, you know, it's not observability if you don't have, you know, if you don't have arbitrarily wide structured data blobs, because if you're constraining people to a certain amount of context, that's, that's not going to give you the ability to answer unknown unknowns. It's only going to give you the ability to answer a certain set of unknown unknowns. It has to be high cardinality. It has to have high dimensionality. It can't have any indexes or schemas because those like preclude, you know, slicing and dicing and arb asking arbitrary questions. It has to have, you know, ordered dimensions for traceability. It has to, you know, support, it has to be exploratory. I mean, and it has to be in near real time. I think the way that I, I succinctly sum it up for people these days is high cardinality, uh, high dimensionality, and exploratory. Like those are the real, really fundamental aspects of the experience um, that differ, that really distinguish observability from, from monitoring and other tools. Did you all know what high cardinality and dimensionality mean? We should explain it for those who don't. That good idea. Yeah. So high cardinality, um, 
cardinality refers in, in mathy stuff, it refers to the number of unique elements in the set. Um, and what this means with data sets is, you know, say you have a collection of 100 million users, um, the, the dimensions with the highest cardinality will be like any unique ID, right? So you have social security number or, you know, a UUID, like those are always unique IDs. And that's the most descriptive that you can possibly get. Um, low cardinality dimensions would be like, you know, um, uh, height <laughs> or, yeah. or, or, you right. know, species. We have a number of Michaels, we have a number of Jessicas, right? Right. If, if there's only one, one value like species equals human, then that's the lowest possible cardinality, right? And so in the spectra, you know, in the spectrum of cardinalities, one of the biggest weaknesses of metrics based systems is that they're all built to support basically low cardinality dimensions. Um, you know, dimensions with under a couple hundred values tops. Um, but when it comes to debugging your systems, the most descriptive data is always the stuff that's high cardinality, right? You, you want to be able to narrow it down to a small number of requests or, or a small subset of things. Not, it's not very useful if you're like, oh, okay, a third of requests have, have this, this symptom or something. Um, so that's low cardinality and uh, high cardinality. <laughs> uh, I would say the opposite because Charity is much more unique than Michael. Um, <laughs> but if you're looking at the number of people per name, then I, I guess I guess that could be. Um, dimensionality is is related. Um, it's like you know if 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 every if every you know everything if this wide event is made up of a lot of key value pairs, right? Um, then cardinality re refers to the value and dimensions refers to the keys. Um, so, you know, if you have an event that has like 500 key value pairs, that's pretty high dimensionality because you've got 500 different, different keys in it. If you've got like 5,000 dimensions, that's a, that's a really high cardinal, that's really high dimensionality. Um, the, the dimensionality of any metric will always be one, <laughs> which is another reason it's so limiting, right? It will always be one. And, and, and the reason that, you know, we, we go for these wide, wide structured events instead of log lines is because logs usually have more than one detail, right? They usually have like a couple, a few. The Apache log is notorious for having at least like 20 or 25, right? If you configured it. Um, but most log lines don't have more than three or four or five bits of data. And so that's only three or four or five dimensionality. So it's pretty low dimensionality, three or four or five dimensions. And so that's all you can like use to correlate. You, you know, you, that's all that you can use to compare this, this, this line with other lines. Um, and, and also logs tend to like spew out during the during the execution paths. So, you know, instead of having one event that sums up all the contents for this request, you know, yeah, for this service, it, instead you'll have like, you know, five to 20 log lines uh, per request per service, which means that, you know, you can't, you can't reason about it without reconstituting it, you know, to mush them all together. Um, there's a there's a comment in the chat that I think is really great. Yeah. Right? So in database terms, high cardinality is akin to a table with many columns, yep. and high dimensionality is akin to a table with many rows. Exactly. Right? I think I think that's pretty good. I think there's a part of the chapter that I want to read in terms of dimensionality, right? And like, why does high dimensionality matter? So the example that we use here is imagine that you have an event schema that has six high cardinality dimensions with, uh, with the following dimensions, time, app, host, user, endpoint, and status, right? And if you have those six things, you can go ahead and create queries that analyze all of things, like a number of qu questions that you could ask, right? You could see all of the 502 errors that occurred in the last hour for host foo, right? You could figure out what are all the 403 errors generated by request to a particular endpoint by a particular user. Um, or you could find any of the timeouts that occurred for requests sent to you know, a payments endpoint by application foo and which host did they came from, right? And that's just with six dimensions, right? If you had other dimensions added to that, like the deploy ID, right? Uh, response code from uh, you know, what, what that endpoint said, Right, um, status code, uh, service name, right, trace spam ID, status. right, like yeah. what happened before this request, what happened after, 
right? The more dimensions you have, the more complex a question you can ask about what state of the system you want to understand, right? So. This is also like, uh, we're used to having dashboards, right? Which is basically you're, you're, picking, you're, you're picking some stuff up front and you're, and you're saying, collect the stuff and display it for me. Um, and you know, when you've got you know, just a few dimensions, it's pretty easy to like create a dashboard for every possible permutation or combination of, of, those, of those, those details. Um, but that's not super useful because what you actually want is not to pre-generate a, a dashboard for every single permutation or combination because then you'll have fucking thousands of dashboards. Um, the goal is for you to have some high level dashboards and then be able to slice and dice and 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 drill down and ask like you know uh so so if there's a spike you know you, is it you know maybe it's it's for all of the maybe it's all of the errors are coming from requests that are you know using ios from this particular region using this you know ios version using this language pack using this um you know aws sdk using this this particular application using using this you know just like all of this stuff you know chained together that's how how you can identify these 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 outliers and these you know these these slices of of you know because one of the problems with these these large distributed systems is that you know it's not like the old days where if you had an uptime of 99.9 .9, you're like okay great you know everybody's had a good experience because it's going to be evenly pretty the, the experience is pretty evenly spread across everyone now you've got these systems where you've got like you know a shard over there that maybe everybody whose first name starts with s h i r it's 100 percent down for them but because it's a small slice even though they're 100 percent down it's still like 99.9 percent .9 up you know and you can have a lot of these like just holes of black holes of, of, you know, errors in your system and still everything can look pretty, pretty okay. So you need to be able to like drill down into, into anything really, any possible combination of, of details might reveal the problem. And I think what we're dancing around, right, is sort of this idea that uh, what is absolutely essential in an observability system is that ability to explore open-ended questions. Right. Rather than creating these predefined views for particular failure states that you might be aware of, what distinguishes observability is the ability to ad hoc in real time, right, ask arbitrary questions, you know, such as some of the examples that we were putting out earlier, right, and figure out, okay, when a failure is occurring, right, what, you know, what was happening in the system at, at any given time, right, what was the 140 second slowest request and why was that so much different than the 143rd slowest request, right? Do you have a dashboard for that? Probably not, right? And so the idea is to be able to compose those questions to get answers in real time. And we'll talk about some of the performance characteristics of what's, what's needed in, a, in an observability system to churn through your data and provide answers so quickly. Um, but, right, at, I guess at a functional level, when it comes to observability, uh, what really defines observability is the ability to ask arbitrary questions about any state that your system might have gotten into or that you need to understand and not hitting an investigative dead end, right? Having high dimensionality and high cardinality data available to be able to find answers to questions about system state, right? In, in any possible there's state. A, that there's a great question in chat. How do you get there without having to manually flag every dimension you mm. might be interested in? Uh, yeah, when you're starting a project, you may have an idea of what you want to track, but you need to be able to add. Absolutely. This is absolutely in scope of this talk. And, and the way this tends to work, maybe Sickles wants to, talk, wants to talk about this a little bit, but you start with auto instrumentation. Do you want to talk about this, Sickles? Absolutely. Yeah. So I think this is a journey for a lot of our customers, uh, especially as you go from this shift from like traditional monitoring into a tool like Honeycomb where you can do observability or any observability tool that may exist out there. And that you need to start somewhere. So auto instrumentation is great for what it gives you. It gives you uh, almost this, this pre-canned view of commonly used systems. So HTTP calls, you can trace across that or database calls, it can tell you which queries are being ran. And that's gonna allow you to ask some questions about your systems, it's a good start. But then you're gonna go, okay, well, I wanna ask another question. And you're gonna go, huh, I'm not getting the answer I need for my auto instrumentation that's out there. So that's a good idea that we probably should add in some new details. What was that question I was trying to ask? So typically I'll, I'll tell 
customers or prospects trying out Honeycomb, uh, pick a couple of key services that you're having trouble understanding. It doesn't have to be everything. We're not trying trying to boil the ocean. And, and on that key workflow, add in the extra details, add a user ID, the tenant ID, the version number, build ID, any of the details you might want to start asking questions about for those key workflows. So you're keeping it small and structured. But once again, you're probably going to end up in a spot where you don't have all the answers you need every single time. You're going to have an incident. You're going to be like, geez, I wish I had these extra details and I didn't have them at the time. That's a good case of go back and add them. So that next time if a problem does happen, you're going to be prepared. And then you're going to attach yourself to existing initiatives. If you're moving to the cloud or you're breaking into microservices, you're going to inherently be touching parts of the code. You want to ask questions on those pieces that are changing. So that's a good time to add in some new attributes, some new details. And then finally, you make the shift into this new observability-driven development world. You're just inherently gonna make it part of your new code process where I am releasing a new code. Part of my GitHub pull request is, do you have the details you need to ask how this is performing in your production system? And that's like this like journey that could be shorter for some customers, it could be longer for others. Uh, but that's generally the high level view of moving from like a traditional system to more this observability approach. Yeah. So, go ahead. That's, thanks. That's, that's super great. I, I think of like, you know, uh, you know, the auto instrumentation creates a framework. And then, you know, as you're writing your code, you should be instrumenting it with the idea towards like, how is future me going to understand this, right? Like I'm writing the code and I ship it. Then I look at it in production. And I ask through the lens of my instrumentation, is it doing what I expected it to do? Does anything else look weird, right? And that's how you kind of close that loop of like, Writing the, writing the code, looking at it, and, and like finding finding the bugs. You'll find like upwards of eighty percent of all bugs right there in that in that short little loop. If you're if you're consistently looking at your code, and and like poking at it and prodding it, and, and just seeing is it doing what I expect it to do. Pickle, do you want to show us a little bit of what that might look like? Absolutely. And so th this is the key thing uh, on like asking questions. I think that's the, the main thing that you need to be able to do is investigate the data, right? And with that, you know, you're, you're going to ask high level questions. So let's start with like the low cardinality. Maybe I want to look at the latency by a different endpoint. And so this is maybe, the, this is name, this is the span name. I can see cart checkout. I can see product ID. I can see the latency, maybe my average, my P90s. But what this doesn't tell me is Who's having a bad experience? And you know, a traditional system, the monitoring system, they might not necessarily care about that, right? They're, they're gonna be good at telling you something overall might be going wrong. They can show you this view of your latency per endpoint. Maybe that's good enough at the beginning, but what if you have certain customers doing different patterns? What if you have one customer who is a large share of your revenue? You're like they're maybe more important, that does happen. We need to be able to understand that differently. Or you have, one customer who's doing some really weird edge case, right? So we're gonna naturally have a follow-up question. Maybe we wanna add in some more dimensionality. We can just add in a user ID field. Now what I've just done is I've broken it down by user ID on this cart checkout or other things, and I can break it down and ask follow-up questions. Or I think George mentioned earlier, right? Maybe I wanna understand how this exists on a given infrastructure thing, my Kubernetes pod. And so I can see how things are on my infrastructure. So it's very similar. It's a new question. But I mean, there's, that's a lot, right? We have this query builder, we can ask infinite amount of questions with our data. Sometimes we need to get a little help, I guess we need to be able to analyze. I think a lot of times we you look at certain interesting patterns. In this case, we see the spike in latency. What we're really ultimately figuring trying to figure out is the root cause or figuring out why, what is different about it. And what's different about it could be any number of dimensions. And so as an example, right, let's just select it. We have the data there. We have the raw data. This isn't pre-aggregated. That's the key thing. And let's analyze those different dimensions, those attributes on it and compare it to the fast areas, the, the baseline, so to speak. And what's going to be bubbled up to me? Oh, look, I can see that it's a place order. I can see that it's uh, a different service. I can see in this case, a specific user is having a bad day. Uh, and, and so like, I saw someone in chat mention, right? Like 
do we need to, is it understanding root cause? Is it understanding impact? And it's a little bit of both, right? Uh, if you release a new feature, is it affecting just one, this poor user tool 109, or is this system wide? Is this something we need to declare an outage for? Or do we just need to get our CS team involved to reach out to that one user who's doing something strange? And so like I can now have the data I need to ask those types of questions. In this case, it's pretty clearly one user is trying to place an order and they're having a bad day. Uh, next time it could be something completely different. And so these dimensions that are bubbled up to me in this case are going to change and I can investigate it, ask follow-up questions. I love it. Uh, let me uh, go ahead and start sharing again. Do you want to show, so close, I want to maybe show uh, like the schema and like what it looks like to have a well-instrumented service. Like maybe we can talk about like, here's what it looks like when you have auto instrumentation, here's what, it, here's what it looks like after, you know, engineers have been, you know, iterating on it and, and just, because one of the awesome things about this model is, you know, with, with metrics, you're, you're, you're often having to prune them. Uh, Dan can back me up on this. He had a great story about having a, some, some metric they were collecting that cost like $35,000 a year or something. Dan Golant, you know what I'm talking about? You know, the cost of metrics goes up, you know, it, it goes up linearly with, with the amount of data that you're storing. And, um, you know, so sometimes you'll be like, ah, oh, this is a useful metric to us, but we can't gather it because, you know, it's too expensive. Um, and the model with wide events is very different. Once you have the event, you can stuff as many dimensions as you want in there and it doesn't cost you any more money. It's, a, it's effectively free for us and it is completely free for you because it's actually better for you and for us the wider you make these events. So, you know, as you're developing over the months and years, you know, whenever you see something interesting, just stuff it into the blob, you know, just you don't have to worry about re repeat. You don't, you don't have to worry about whether it's going to be useful someday or not. If you think it might be useful, just stuff it into the blob. And so, you know, as the, as the service matures, you know, I think a, a really mature service we see usually has somewhere between like 300 and 500 dimensions, you know, um, per request. And, um, <laughs> right, with all of the unique IDs and all of the, you know, high cardinality dimensions that you want, it's all fine. Just stuff it in there. Someday it might be useful. You don't know. One moment here. I'm going to pull up. I have it paused so I can pull up our own uh, system and kind of show how many like we have. Uh, let's see here. So this is our microservices demo environment. This is something that is Google's GoThinkster app that we instrumented with open telemetry. Most of it honestly is auto instrumentation. We just did the out of the box, throw in and get out like what you can out of it. Uh, Extra details might be the user ID. You saw I had user 20109 in there, or I add in something like uh, uh, a cart total, right? So I can ask questions on how much money my users are spending in this cool e-commerce app. And, and this, you know, it has a couple, like maybe 100, 200 kind of to fields. Most of it probably from that auto instrumentation. Then we get to something like Honeycomb's own system. This is our ingest data set, our shepherd. Uh, everything is named after dogs and honeycomb. And if I just start scrolling here, I mean, just look at all the different things. One of my favorite things is we put our uh, launch darkly flags as attributes, so whether they're enabled or not, because why not? As Charity said, it's free. Why wouldn't we wanna be able to ask questions of which flags are enabled or disabled, or we can ask product questions more so than uh, just performance-based questions. And we will add things like our teams and their data sets and their uh, different unique identifiers. We can see when you run queries in Honeycomb, what are the queries that you're trying to build? Or are there aggregates? Like just all these just data overload that we can just ask questions about. And it's great because then you can also share it with your team, right? So I, I can go back and go, oh, what are the different things that I'm going ask, asking questions about? I use Honeycomb myself. I'm in you know, pre-sales, but I ask questions as you can see in here, I'm grouping by app team ID and their environments. And I'm looking where uh, teams are in a trial account because I tend to work with people in the, this pre-sales spot. And I'm asking, okay, well, how many uh, events are they sending? How many people are getting rate limited? So it's like, I, Michael Sickles has so many different questions than charity or our engineers might ask where they're gonna be probably coming in here and asking specific questions on, you know, how is the system performing? Thanks. Awesome. Ooh, 
Uh, While you're there, you want to show history and team history real quick. It's just like, like my favorite thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so my history is basically the queries I've ran. And what's great is I can query my query history. So if I asked an interesting question last week that I don't remember, I can query that like, oh, I remember I, maybe I used this one field in there. But also my teammates, like as I came on the Honeycomb, I didn't know how to use the tool fully. I didn't know what kinds of questions I could ask. There is this piece when adopting a new tool that's really freaking difficult to know how to use it. And a lot of the times the knowledge is out there somewhere. Somebody asked a question before that might be interesting and we wanna be able to pick their brain. Uh, Pierre is my boss. And I can say, okay, well, these are the questions that Pierre is asking. Maybe since I'm you know, on his team, I can follow along with what he's doing here. So I can just go ahead and click on this query. And it looks like Pierre was asking a question on our load across all our different partitions in our systems. And I know now, he does this because when we scale out our customers in a trial, we need to make sure that we're putting them on the least loaded partitions as we scale them out. And so these are the types of questions we might ask. Uh, and likewise, you know, engineers might follow along in an incident. There's an incident going on. What is everyone else doing right now? Maybe someone's on a different thread that I can follow along. I'll pick their query, start from there, and start my own journey. Sweet. So um, I think we're going to go ahead and move the conversation along a bit because we sort of went into this like deep dive of what is it like to answer questions arbitrarily about any system state and and now right like looking at the practice of well what are other people on my team asking right and like really sort of this whole practice of interrogating your systems and sort of changing how you think about understanding what's happening in your code right and it's a real shift from monitoring right and and metrics and like we, there there's a section in the book where we really harp on the metric right and the metric has been around for decades and the whole idea behind a metric was to really just quickly look at one aspect of system health and represent what is happening as a number right like right now cpu is 70 percent okay great is that good is that bad right and monitoring is all about applying a threshold Right. Well, you know that maybe 90% CPU is bad and you want to be alarmed or triggered, have an alarm triggered that tells you that that's happening. Um, and uh, I think metrics and monitoring have, have been a great tool to, you know, to a point that was happening in chat earlier to understand system state, right? But observability is about understanding both why is that state occurring and what is its impact. Right. And so there's a little bit of a shift that needs to happen in order to get there. So I think sort of based on what I'm seeing in, in the chat window, we should talk about how observability and monitoring come together. But do we want to spend a couple minutes just talking about like how we get there? Charity, there's a really great uh, chapter. I think it's chapter three that is all oh, about parts. Yeah, right? sorry, I was, uh, I was answering questions in, in chat. <clears throat> I wasn't paying attention. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> I have a very painful story that, that this is the one that basically led to Honeycomb being created about um, what our experiences with Parse. Um, Parse was like Heroku for mobile. It's it's where Christine and I, and Ben Hartshorn and Ian Wilkes all worked uh, before doing Honeycomb. And you know, Parse was you know run this running this very large multi-tenant, massively multi-tenant system. Uh, on a system that you know had a fixed pool of unicorn workers, it was it was Ruby, so it was not a threaded language, and you know a different app would hit the iTunes top ten like every day, and Parse would go down <laughs> just like that, and <clears throat> you know every time we'd be starting over from scratch, like okay, which app was it? Because you know it, you know we had all these metrics that would show us the top ten apps, but often it wasn't one of the top ten. You know it might be like number twenty. Uh, or it might be one, you know, might, might be number 580. It might be something we'd never seen before, right? Um, and so we would be <laughs> grepping through log files, just trying to figure out, you know, by hand what was going on. It was extremely tedious. Um, the only people who could, who could ever figure out was what was going on were, were the ops people. Um, developers had no clue of understanding what was going on. Um, and we had tons of dashboards, like we were doing state-of-the-art stuff when it came to metrics and stuff. But, you know, when it came to, you know, the PAR system, we were doing a lot of things that were kind of very much ahead of their time. Like we were doing microservices before there were microservices. We were doing, you know, 
we were just doing a lot of patterns that we didn't really have words for yet or, or patterns for yet. All we knew is that we were getting bludgeoned <laughs> every night, every day parts was going down and it was, it was rough. Um, we actually went into like a six month, like company lockdown of just like shipping no features. All we were doing was, you know, trying to rewrite the system from Ruby on Rails to, to Golang um, to get, you know, a multi-threaded model in there and working and sharding our MongoDB and like, all the shit that we were doing just to try to try to get parts to stay up. And, you know, Facebook being Facebook, they kept stuffing things at us and telling them they would, they would solve our problems. And they never did um, until one, <laughs> one of the tools that they gave us uh, was called scuba. And it actually, it actually did solve our problems. You know, we started, it was this but ugly, like God awful tool that was just aggressively hostile to users in every way. It was not fun to use. Um, but what it did do was let you slice and dice and hide cardinality dimensions in, you know, well, it wasn't as fast as honeycomb, but it was like within like a minute um, and it would slice and dice pretty quickly. And, you know, we started feeding some data sets in, into Scuba and the amount of time that it took us to like figure out where the problem was coming from dropped like a rock, like from hours, days, often we'd never find the problem. We'd just like magically fix itself and we'd be left going, did you see that? <laughs> I didn't see that. Um, to like, you know, seconds, maybe minutes, usually seconds, because we could, we could start at the top and slice and dice and, and work our way down. You know, we could, instead of having to like tail that chef, squint and try to pick out patterns with our eyes or trying to like, compare yesterday's top 10 list to today's top 10 list or all these really kludgy things. Instead, we could just, you know, start start with like, okay, let's break it down by endpoint and where are the errors coming from? Is it all the endpoints? Uh, no, it's just the right endpoints. Okay, so if it's, it's the right endpoints, is it is it all of them? Uh, is it to all of the backends? No, it looks like the ones that are writing to Redis and MySQL are fine. It's only the ones that are going to MongoDB. Okay, well, is it going, is it erroring on all the Mongo shards? Or is it erroring on all the nodes, like primaries and secondaries? Oh, no, it's just this subset over here, um, which corresponds to, you know, the secondaries on these three shards. Okay, so that means, you know, it's, you know, or, or the, the primaries on these three shards. Okay, so we know that it's, you know, something is writing to like this set of apps so then break down my application and 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 see you know you could just like follow the trail of, of breadcrumbs right to the source every time without having to know anything at all in advance about what it might be which was just a sh total shift of night and day from like stabbing around to the dark to just like step 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 oh there it is right and that was when we finally started to get a handle on re our reliability issues and you know it it was transformative because finally we could figure out what to work on <laughs> finally we could figure out how to fix the system in a matter of you know seconds instead of you know, we were spending hours every single day just flailing around trying to diagnose things because this is this is how the system was different from all the systems I had worked on before that, you know, all the systems I had worked on up to this, like I, I'd worked on some pretty big systems, but they all tend to fail in pretty predictable ways, right? You would work on them for, you know, a year or two and you, you'd know where the gremlins live, you'd know, you know, you'd be able to just you know, you could intuit where the problem was coming from. Even if your dashboards didn't tell you, you knew from, you know, from like past trauma, you'd be like, well, I'm pretty sure it's this and this. Um, but at I parts, think, it was I, a think, different I, I think there's a really great big thing that I want to highlight there, Charity, right? Which is, you know, oftentimes because we talk a lot about observability and sort of, you know, this, this different way of understanding your systems, it comes off as anti-monitoring. Right. right. And like to be absolutely clear, we're not anti monitoring. Right. And to Charity's point, if you work on a simple system that fails in predictable ways, right. And, and monitoring and like, you know, a metric that tells you what system health is and you God can bless. sort of divine what that means and like fix it. Great. Awesome. So glad that's working for you. Right. But if you are working in a, in an environment that, you know, fails in unpredictable ways, you're dealing with modern distributed systems and you need a better approach. Right. That's when observability really starts or starts to matter. And I'm I'm looking at the clock and I really want to get to this part of the discussion. So I'm gonna like just push us a little bit forward. We've sort of been talking about this throughout today's webinar, but like let's talk about how monitoring and observability come together, 
right? And there are places where observability really matters and like, you know, where that high dimensionality and high cardinality absolutely helps you figure out issues and where traditional monitoring is still good enough, right? And so yeah. I want to highlight, I think in chapter nine, we have this table, more or less, right? It looks a little bit different in the book. Um, but we, we kind of look at a number of different factors, right? Like, what are you trying to understand about your system, right? Like, what are your concerns? What are you trying to evaluate, right? And based on what you're answering, right, is, is, is this a good approach for monitoring or is this a good approach for observability? No, Charity and Sickles, what do you think about this? Whoops. I have a lot of words because I come from the <laughs> traditional monitoring world, right? Uh, this is prior to Honeycomb. I used to work uh, for a traditional monitoring tool. And I, I think traditional monitoring has, I think it was alluded to a little bit earlier, it does have its use cases and it's, it's good for some problems. Absolutely. You can see high level views and it's, it's maybe catching those past problems again, right? You can cr absolutely create an alert to try to catch that past problem, but it doesn't solve the next unknown problem. Uh, one of the common things I see with customers, like, and I like to, to point that out, CPU. CPU goes high and everyone's like, yeah, that's bad. Let's put an alert on CPU going high. And it's like, well, why? Why does that even matter? Who cares if CPU is going high? You're paying for it. Why shouldn't it go high? And it always boils down to like, it's affecting my customer experience, right? And yeah. so I think monitoring is absolutely great for that. That CPU is going high. You can't really instrument infrastructure, right? You, you have to get some kind of signal. And so CPU going high is, is a signal that you can absolutely use to see that a problem is upcoming, but it doesn't tell you why your CPU is going high. It doesn't even tell you if your customer is having any problems because it's going high. And that's where observability comes in. Yeah, and if you and if you're alerting yourself on things like CPU spikes, holy hell, <laughs> your life is not happy, right? Because like when it comes to alerting, you really need to align engineering pain with customer pain, like as closely as possible. You do not want to be waking people up in the night or even just distracting them from their work just because of fluctuations or in symptoms, right? Only when when your but when your customers are impacted, you do want to let someone know not always in the middle of the night and you know that that's debatable we can talk about that all day but um but like certainly if they're not being impacted you don't want to wake anybody up and so i don't know sickles maybe can we look at a way that or i guess how how we handle this right like what what is the yeah. way that we sort of split monitoring along with observability and, and how do we make those two things come together sure can let me share my screen here so you're going to need some monitoring in place. Just, just to be clear, even Honeycomb has monitoring in place, and I'll show that in a moment uh, with our Kafka views. Charity wrote a wonderful blog on when monitoring and, and when you want to get metrics versus when you want to use tracing and structured events. And the key thing here is things you can't get insights into infrastructure, like you can't instrument infrastructure, uh, maybe proprietary systems. If you're using Kafka, right? You can't necessarily instrument your Kafka application code. And even if you could, great. Now you find their bugs for them. <laughs> what next? Like you're not going to be able to necessarily fix it. So it's good to have uh, a, a view of how your Kafka system is performing, but not necessarily the level of detail you might need in, in a system. So that's a, like what we need there is just a signal. Is, is Kafka having a problem? And do I need to tell Confluent Cloud, hey, there's a problem, or do I just need to scale up my cluster? Those are good key things for metrics and monitoring. Uh, and so now I have this view in Honeycomb. Here, I'm basically looking at my latency grouping by pod name. This is running on uh, 10 different services. It's 10 different nodes in a Kubernetes EKS cluster. And I can absolutely start here. I can see my memory utilization is going up, right? That's That might be a problem. That's a symptom. And it does actually seem to correlate here. Now, I see memory go up. I see it crashing. That's clearly to me a memory leak. If I'm the infrastructure guy, maybe my first thought is just give it some more memory right now, right? Like maybe I just need to pad it and go up a size up. And I think that's a perfectly acceptable thing to do in the moment. If, if somebody's impacted, your customers are impacted, sometimes it's just spend a little bit more money and go for a bigger size uh, piece of equipment. That's okay. But this doesn't tell me once again, why is my memory going up? Why is my CPU going up? And that's where here, 
I can do the same things I did before where maybe I come in here and I, I bubble up. I kind of get those insights. I can see the impact. It's a customer. It's a specific service. Or I even go inside here a little bit more. And now I have things like um, I'm calling the database a whole bunch of times. I know my code. I built this code, right? Hey, wait a minute. Isn't this get discounts supposed to be pulling from a cache? Why am I calling the database a whole bunch of times? Maybe this gives me a clue onto where that memory leak is going. I can have infinite cardinality. I can add any attributes. Maybe I want to add that cache size as an attribute because I, it's important to me. I can see that going up. I can ask questions about that attribute, right? It's just that you can have wide events to ask interesting questions later that might be related to a problem. And to ultimately the root cause of this is that, yeah, for user 20109, we have a bug in our code that's causing a memory leak because I'm supposed to be pulling from a cache, but instead I'm calling the database a bunch, right? So like there's a lot of that kind of correlated together to that memory going up and we needed to have the details to truly understand it. Awesome. That is a great demo. There's a, there's a comment in the chat that I want to highlight, which is um, Peter says monitoring works for me when I already know the question I want answered, right? Maybe you just don't ding, 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 know ding. what's happening, right? But observability is for when I don't yet know what I'm looking for. And that is absolutely 100% spot on. So uh, great. I want, I'm, I'm looking at the clock and we have a lot of questions. So here's what I'm going to say. We have covered a ton of great content today. And so again, as a reminder, if you have questions, drop them in chat. We're going to get to some of the questions that have been asked so far. Um, and while we do that, I'm going to remind you that we do value your feedback. So if you complete a survey about this webinar before 12 PM Pacific tomorrow, uh, we'll send you a t-shirt to say thanks. Uh, this survey has a password for reasons I don't understand, um, but you will need that to enter. So your password for this uh, survey is event two. And Bethany has dropped a link to that uh, in the chat. Um, all right. Also, uh, we have a ton of questions today. And so we are going to continue answering questions as long as we can on today's webinar. Uh, but you can also continue this chat in our pollinator Slack group in the book club channel. So we'll go there and continue answering questions, um, after we are done here today. So with that, um, let's get to some questions. So I'm going to scroll back up and there are a number of questions here that are great. Um, uh, first question. Uh, so we've talked a lot about data with high cardinality and high dimensionality. Um, what are the sources of that data and how many data sources uh, can we support uh, in our system? Charity Sickles, you want to talk about what some of those sources are? Oh, I'm, I don't, I'm looking for the text. Where is it? Uh, it's, it's a lot further up. But, I think we're in Slack. We just use Slack. Yeah. I think we have them in our, our Slack channel. But I mean, we we accept tons of different data sources. Here, here's the key thing that I, I always find interesting about Honeycomb. It's, it's a really amazing thing about it is at its core, everything is just a structured JSON event. And so what that means is we can accept any data source. Is there going to be easy auto instrumentation for everything? No, uh, there's going to be a lot. Uh, I can't tell you, I can tell you and give a list of all the different integrations. We have AWS integrations out of the box. We have tracing out of the box. We have all these cool things. But I've typically, I mean, I've, I've ran into some customers like, oh, you don't have an integration. Can I still get that data into Honeycomb? It's like, yeah, maybe you just do some manual instrumentation. Just hit our JSON API endpoint and start asking questions. Um, it, it really, the world's your oyster. Have, you can do whatever you want to do if you just structure it. Yeah. Um, there's a semi-related question as well that was like asked in towards the beginning of the the, the webinar, uh, which is, is the current advice to not use automated OTEL instrumentation because those libraries tend to have internal traces to a service? Uh, example, use, service, yeah. internal database, et cetera. Use, use auto instrumentation and just, yeah. I, I say start, it's a good place to start just to see what it gets you. Because you might not, it, like, it's, it's a good entry point to start asking questions about your system. Don't go in with the expectation that auto instrumentation is going to solve all your problems. That's going to take you so far. You're going to want to add manual instrumentation. And there's various things, you know, to make that easy, even in open telemetry, as an example. You do resource attributes to grab environment variables. You can so literally one line of code to add like that user ID to a span. So yes, use auto instrumentation. Yes, also use manual on top of it. It's, it's a lot like, you know, commenting your code or adding documentation. You can auto-generate that stuff, but 
it's not going to be very good, right? It's a starting point at best. You, it, you, it's really all about capturing your intent as an engineer. And so, you know, if you really want to have great instrumentation, you need to put some intent into it. That said, we've made it really darn easy. It's as easy as a printf. It doesn't get much easier than that. There are two questions that I think uh, we touch on in, in future uh, installments and like we talk about them in later chapters of the book, but I'm gonna talk about both of them here, uh, at least give, well, hopefully we can give some short answers. Um, one, uh, why did I just lose this? Um, uh, somebody uh, was asking, uh, can observability be used uh, for usage tracking such as how often or when are people using a particular piece of functionality? Um, so I answered this in the chat and I wanted to call out like later in the book, I think it's chapter 20, um, observability stakeholders and allies. We look at adjacent use cases, like the primary use case that we talk about in terms of observability for most of the book is uh, understanding uh, application issues, right? And so uh, there is a section where we talk about like, you know, use cases that are adjacent to that, and one of those is understanding, um, you know, as a product manager, right? When I released a particular code feature, who is using this feature? And because you, if if you've instrumented uh, uh, your your uh, your code the way that we've been talking about, right? You can go ahead and figure out like who is accessing this particular bit of code, right? And you can see on a per customer, on a per user level, right? Who is using it? So in chapter twenty, we talk about um, business intelligence uh, type use cases. Right, where uh, we get a little bit more explicit about how you can drill into that. And so we'll be talking about that in a future episode, but I just wanted to highlight that one. Um, there is also a question about uh, the storage requirements necessary for this much cardinality. And so uh, chapter 16, we end up talking about uh, storage systems and what you need to build in order to retrieve you know, arbitrarily wide events, right? And those kinds of JSON blobs that we're talking about and how to do that on the magnitude of you know billions of events looking across thousands of fields. But I don't know, between now and then, Charity or Sickles, anything you want to say about the storage requirements that are necessary for observability? The core concept to understand is that we use a columnar store. Um, and that's why, you know, everything I'm saying about how you know you don't want indexes, you don't want schemas, because those will you know lock you into a, you know a, a non-elastic you know set of dimensions. Um, a column, columnar store is basically like every dimension is a is an index, um, and and then we have you know distributed query model where we fan out and scan and then perform a merge and return. Um, it's just really fucking fast, <laughs> and we did put like a lot of the details in the book itself. So if you want to go build your own, God bless. <laughs> All right, with that, um, we are almost to the top of the hour, so that is most of what we have time for. Again. We're going to continue to answer questions uh, in the Pollinator Slack group. So there is a link to that in the chat window. You can join us in the book club channel. Um, I also want to point out that we have some great events coming up, so be sure to check those out. And specifically, I want to call out our live in-person book signing event. So if you are in the Seattle area, you can join us on June 23rd at 6 p.m. We're going to be at the Smith Tower Observatory Bar in downtown Seattle. Uh, and we'll be giving out copies of the O'Reilly book signed by all three authors, and we will yes. all be there. Um, uh, we need to just sign a lot of books. Uh, so you'll find a, an RSVP link to that in the email that you should receive after we conclude today's session. Um, and with that, uh, I believe you can find more webinars in this series, along with other helpful content at honeycomb.io in our resource library. Again, you can join pollinators as well to continue the conversation. And I wanna thank Charity and Sickles for joining me in today's presentation. Uh, remember that a link to watch this webinar on demand will be in your inbox soon. And feel free to share a link to that webinar if you found today's content useful. So thank you for joining thank us, everybody. everyone. Have a great week. <laughs>